Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And today, I'm going to walk you through the wilds of data handling in React. And when I talk about data handling, what I'm talking about is when a user comes to your site and they start putting data into the site, how do you make sure that you persist that data and also show it to them all over the page where it's supposed to show up? And I call it the wilds because when you first look at this landscape, excuse me, when you first look at this landscape, it can seem like an untamed profusion of different options. But when you look at it closer, there are really three very uh, distinct ways of doing this. And they're actually easier to understand than you might think. So I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour through this landscape. The first of these three was Flux. And there's a kernel of an idea in Flux that carries through th to the other two. And so I want to start with that kernel, that idea. And this is it. Now, don't worry if you don't understand it. This whole project started because I didn't understand this diagram when I first came to it. But once you understand Flux, this diagram is very clear. Before explaining this diagram, though, I should really explain the problem that Flux solves. Flux and React both come from Facebook. I'm sure that you all have realized this by now. And they were developed side by side to address a particular set of problems that Facebook was seeing. And this was the notification bug. How many of you remember this notification bug from a few years ago where you would, you know, go to Facebook, see a notification saying that you had a new message, and then you click on it, and it would go away? But then you'd start going about the business, whatever you were doing on Facebook before, and it would come back again. I would just keep going back and forth and back and forth. It was this cycle. But it wasn't just a cycle for you, the user. It was also a cycle for the developers at Facebook. You know, they'd fix it, and then would come back again. <laughs> so they wanted to fix it once and for all and end this cycle of unpredictability. When they looked closer, they saw that the source of the problems was in the way that they were handling data. They had these models that held the data. And then those models, when a user would come to the site and view a page, those models would push the data out to the views. Well, of course, the views also provided a user interface for users to add more data. So the views had to push that data back up to the models. And sometimes there are dependencies between models. So you have model-to-model -model communication. Now, this all starts kind of looking like an epic game of Pong. It's really hard to tell where this ball is going to hit. Throw in the fact that you could have changes happening, cas uh, like this cascade of changes, happening concurrently. When one change comes in, it could be creating a couple more different changes that are happening asynchronously, which I think of as kind of like taking a bag full of ping pong balls and throwing it into your pong game. It gets really, really hard to tell where all, the ball all these balls are going to hit and where they're going to fall off the page. So Facebook, the developers of Facebook, they wanted to make this more predictable. They wanted to make it easy to figure out the effects of a user interaction, and Flux was the way that they did that. So now we're back to this diagram, and this is the diagram that you'll see in the Flux docs. What it's showing you is a unidirectional data flow. So unidirectional, you've heard this if you work with React. You might be familiar with it from React components. The Flux use of unidirectional is a little bit different, but same basic concept. You have this flow from the action to the dispatcher, to the store, to the view. And then once it gets to the end of this flow, you start back at the action. Now contrast this with what we were seeing before in this epic game of Pong. So you can see this unidirectional data flow. But if you don't actually already understand what all of these parts do, I don't think this diagram gives you a good understanding of flux itself. And it certainly didn't help me when I first came to it. What did help me understand Flux was thinking about it as a group of characters, working together as a team to complete some task. So I want to introduce you to that cast of characters that I have in my head, and hopefully it'll help you understand Flux in the same way that it helps me. The first of these characters is the action creator. And I think of the action creator as basically a telegraph operator. So other parts of the system, they want to make changes 
but they don't actually know how to say that change in the way that the rest of the system's gonna understand them. So they go to the action creator to format the action. And this action that is formatting is an object. It's an object with a couple of, of particular properties. It has a type. And so that type is an action type. Things like message read, message create, message delete. And then there's a payload. And that payload has all the informa information that the system needs to perform that action. And these action types, those are things that you come up with for whatever interactions, whatever state changes you have on the site, you create an action for it, an action type. And the neat thing about this is that you then have a list of all of the possible state changes in your app. So when a new developer comes on, they can just look at this list and know all of the things that your app supports. The next character, so now that the action creator has created this action that represents the change that needs to happen, the next character is the dispatcher. And the dispatcher is kind of like a switchboard operator. It has a big registry of callbacks. It gets a change, it gets one of these actions coming in, and then it knows how to send that change out to the rest of the system. So it has this registry of callbacks that it uses to do this. Now Flux, the Flux dispatcher is a little different from dispatchers in other systems. The Flux dispatcher dispatches this action to every registered callback. In other systems, you'll have dispatchers that can, you know, where somebody can listen, a, a store could listen to a particular set of actions and not to others. Well, Flux doesn't concern itself. This dispatcher does not concern itself with the types at all. It just passes all actions out to the stores that are registered with it. So that brings us to the store. I think of the store as basically an over-controlling bureaucrat. All state and state change logic live on the store, and there are no setters. There's no way for the view to come to the store and say, hey, I need you to change X, Y, and Z, and oh, could you delete this other thing? Instead, what the store is basically saying to the views and to the other parts of the system is, no one's gonna change this data besides me, and if you want me to change it, you're gonna have to go through the official channels. You're gonna to have to go through this action pipeline from the action creator to the dispatcher to the store. So that brings us to our next character, the view and the controller view. So the view and the controller view, they're now sometimes called the presentational view and the container view. The view is a presenter, the presentational view is a presenter, what happens is props get passed to it. It doesn't really know anything about the system behind it, but it knows that these props are gonna get passed to it. And it knows how to show those props to the user. It knows how to create the HTML that the user expects to see. Now the container view actually does have a little bit more of a picture of what's going on behind the scenes. The container view talks to the store and knows when the store gets updated. It's basically acting as a middle manager between the store and the view below it. So these are the four characters in, in Flux. Let's take a look at how they all work together. First, of course, they need to start talking to each other. They need to let each other know, you know that they're here, they're listening. So the store is gonna talk to the dispatcher and say, whenever there's an action that comes in, can you let me know? Can you send it along to me? And the dispatcher will add it to his list of callbacks and then the uh, container view will ask for the initial state from the store. And the store passes that initial state down. And once the container view gets that state, it passes it down to the presentational views below it. And the container view also asks the store, hey, could you give me any updates? Whenever you've updated the state, let me know, I'll pass it down to the presentational view, this, this update. So let's take a look, now that everything's wired up, let's take a look at how it all works together, how the data flows when a user interacts with the site. So the user is gonna ask the view to change something, maybe the middle number of that chart needs to be higher. So the user will uh, initiate this interaction. Then the view goes to the action creator and tells it what action it needs. And the action creator creates that action and passes it along to the dispatcher, who then passes it along to the store or the stores, there are multiple stores, you can have multiple stores in Flux. And each one of these stores is gonna think about whether or not it cares about this kind of action, and if it does, it's going to change the state. It'll let the container view know. The container view will ask for that updated state, 
and it'll get it, and then it passes it down to the presentational view below it. So that's Flux, and it ended the cycle of brokenness, and all rejoiced and created a hundred different implementations of it. <laughs> now on to Redux. Redux is a lot like Flux, uh, and if you're using anything Flux-like, you're probably using Redux at this point. There's a good chance. Um, so yeah, it's an evolution of Flux, just a couple of changes. But if Flux solved this problem, why even change it? Well, the creator of Redux, um, Dan Abramov, who unfortunately could not be with us today, um, he had seen some innovations outside of the React ecosystem that he wanted to bring to React. And I should note, you know, these are, um, what he saw were, were debugging techniques. Uh, Redux actually helps you with a lot more than just making better developer tools, making these debugging techniques possible. But I think that it's this use case of debugging techniques is actually a really helpful way to think about the changes that were made. So I'm gonna keep going with it. Um, but just be aware that Redux also has other advantages. So these debugging techniques that he saw in other communities, they were things like hot module reloading or hot loading uh, and time travel debugging. Before I talk about what changes he made to enable those though, I should explain what exactly those things are. Let's start with hot loading. Imagine that you are building a to-do list application. And so you have, uh, you're testing it out, you have a few to-dos that you're testing with, eat, sleep, all important things. And you have a function that adds these to-dos. And you're adding them to the end of the list, to the back of the list. Well, once you start working with it, you see that to-dos are gonna be added below the fold. Nobody's gonna see their to-dos added. So you need to change this so that you're now adding to-dos to the front of the list. When you make the change to your code, how do you see that it's actually worked? Well, you reload that object. Of course, when you reload that object, you lose the state. So now you have to type in all your to-dos again to keep testing it. What the innovation, what you need to do to actually make it possible to not lose your state, but also test out your functionality, is to actually split this into two objects. One object that holds on to the state, and one object that can be re reloaded whenever you change the logic on that object. So you can reload that object that holds on to the functions without reloading the object that holds on to the state. So this is what you need for hot module reloading. Time travel debugging is kind of similar. You know, you start off with your app in an initial state, and then you take an action, and then you end up at a new state. And you do that a couple more times. Now, think about if your problem manifests, if you only see your problem between step two and step three here. Hot module reloading, hot loading is not gonna get you that interaction that you want where you can just rapidly switch back and forth between coding and seeing the changes. And the reason that it's not going to is because it's actually between step two and step three. You've already gotten to step three. You've already changed your state so that you're at step three, you know, past step three. What you need to do is be able to step backwards in time, to step backwards to two, to be at the state position that you were in at the end of step two. And that's what time travel debugging enables. Now, how do you actually make your app, make it possible to do time travel debugging? Well, one way you can do it is by actually keeping a snapshot of the state at the end of each of these steps. But in order to do that, you need to make sure, make sure that you're not changing that state object between these steps. And so that's where you get into things like immutability. You know, having pure functions where you're just passing in a state object and taking an action and then returning a new state object, not changing the old one but returning a new one that has the changes applied. So Redux makes these two things possible. It makes hot reloading and time travel debugging possible. I'm not gonna walk through exactly how it does that. Um, it's very similar to Flux, and I have written it up. If you wanna step through, you can go to codecartoons.com and see a cartoon that walked all the way through it. But I do wanna point out two things, two key differences. And the first is in the way that the store handles data changes, state changes. The store, there's only one store in Redux, 
and it holds on to a single state object, a single state tree. It doesn't actually perform any of the logic to change the state, though. It will pass that single state tree that it's holding on to to something called a reducer. And whenever an action comes in, it'll pass the state and the reducer down. Or sorry, the state and the action down to the reducer. So this is what we needed for hot module reloading, as you remember. We needed to have this separation between the thing that holds on to the state and the thing that actually changes the state. The way that the reducer does this is by copying the state that it was passed and making changes to the copy. So as you'll remember, this is what we needed for time travel debugging. In addition to this change, I want to point out another change that was made in Redux, and that's in the way that the store and the views talk to each other. So as you'll remember in Flux, you actually needed your container view to talk to the store and say, let me know whenever the state changes and then it needs to prepare any of the variables that were coming down. Well, Redux does away with this. It puts something in between called the view layer binding. And I like to think of the view layer binding as kind of like an IT department. It makes sure all of the views are hooked up to this data network and makes sure it pushes out the data to those views. So it just helps a little bit with some of this boilerplate and to make things a little bit clearer. So that's Redux. Now we move on to Relay. If you've been following along closely up until now, you might have a question, and that's where's the cloud? Where is the interaction with the server? How do you fetch data from a server, and how do you sync changes back up to a server? Flux doesn't have one set place to do this, and if you were attending last year, this conference last year, you might actually have heard them say, a, a few different people um, who were using Flux at Facebook, you would have heard them say that there isn't one set place that they were doing it, even within one organization. Redux does have one place for interactions with the cloud, and that's in middleware. But if you want to do complex things like complex caching or query optimization, you have to find the tools to do that yourself or build them and wire it all up. What Relay does is it handles a lot of that for you without you actually having to write a lot of complex code on the client. It'll handle things like caching, query optimization, taking care of network errors. So that's what it does. But first, it hooks you up to the cloud, but first we should ask, what is in the cloud? Well, in the case of an app like Facebook, it's a giant graph of data. And when I talk about graph here, I'm talking about a graph theory kind of graph. So I'm talking about uh, a huge number of objects, of things, and the relationships between these things. So an example of a thing would be something like a user or an event. Uh, and an example of a relationship would be like the relationship of a friend between two users, or the relationship of invited to between a user and an event. In graph theory, the things here are often called nodes, and the relationships between them are often called uh, edges. So you have a whole lot of, you know, what you have in the cloud is this graph. A whole lot of things, a whole lot of relationships between these things. But when you're showing a page to any one user, you only care about a tiny, tiny bit of this graph. What Relay does is it makes it easy to pick out this tiny bit of the graph that you care about and to manage the relationship between the graph in the cloud, the tiny bit of the graph in the cloud that you care about, and the tiny bit of the graph that you have cached. It knows how to manage this for you because you declare which bits of the graph you need for each component right next to the component. This is what uh, Ben was talking about this morning with co-location. So it knows exactly, when it's looking at the component tree, it knows exactly how to build the query graph that goes along with that component tree. Now let's compare this with the way that communication with the cloud usually happens. And this is not in all apps, but in a lot of apps. The way that a lot of people design web apps, you have an endpoint, and that endpoint knows what data to give you. You'll send up a request, and then that endpoint's gonna say, okay, I know that I need to send you these properties in order for you to render the page. 
This results in, in coupling between the client and the server, because if any one of these components adds a new property that it wants to show, you have to add that to the server too, not just to the component code, you have to add it to the server code. Relay fixes this by having the component say exactly what bit of the graph it cares about. So this avatar component can say, I need the picture. And the bio component can say, you know, I need the name and location. And then the app can bundle up that query together and ask specifically for those fields from the endpoint, and the endpoint can deliver them. So when that data is delivered, Relay puts it into a local cache, and it pushes out the data from that local cache out to the components that needed it. When you have this kind of structure, it enables you to do really cool things. Things like having your component say exactly what it does makes it possible to have deferred queries. Where, say that you have a, a news article, and the important things to show the user are the you know, headline, the body. The comments, they don't really have to show up right now. So you could defer the query to get the comments, and you send them both up to the server. When the required bits come down, they get pushed out to the component. And then when the deferred bits come down, they get merged in to the graph and get sent out to the component that needs them. It also makes it possible to reduce the size of the queries. Let's say that you went to another page and it mostly shows the same data. What really makes it possible to do is to take out the bits that you already have in your local cache and just query for the data that you need. And then when that comes down, it'll get merged into that graph and sent out to the component. It also makes it really easy to sync changes. So let's say that you need to add a new node. You need to add a new thing to this graph. What Relay can do is first optimistically update. It can make a guess at what changes are gonna need to happen in the graph and will optimistically update your local cache. And then it'll push up the change and the query for the data that it thinks will be changing. And when that comes down, it can handle it. If it was an error, it can handle that. Or if it succeeded, it can make sure that all of the little bits of the graph that might have changed are updated. Now, I don't really have enough time to talk about exactly how Relay does this. Relay is actually a framework. It gives you a lot of functionality. Whereas, you know, Flux and Redux are more patterns or libraries. Relay's doing a lot for you. But I do have a four-part code cartoon on codecartoons.com uh, if you want to check out exactly, walk through exactly how this works. I do want to point out the thread that ties it to the other two, though. And that is that these state changes, they're handled with objects. You don't have views going and saying exactly what the model should be doing. Instead, you have objects that represent those state changes. In Flux and Redux, it's the action, and in Relay, it's, in, it's the mutation. But you're declaring exactly what, you, what change you need to happen. So that's Relay. Let's review. Flux was created to fix the cycle of unpredictability. And the way that it does that is by creating this unidirectional data flow. Redux built on Flux. It split apart the object that holds the state from the logic to change that state. And also handles these changes immutably so that you aren't actually changing the state object. You're creating a new state object that has the changes applied to it. And Relay, Relay deals more with how you connect the graph that you have in the cloud to the graph that you have cached on your server. So that's how I think of these things. I hope it's helped you think about them more clearly too. If you wanna learn more, you can find these cartoons on codecartoons.com or follow Code Cartoons on Twitter. And I just wanna say thank you very much.